Hey, and welcome to the video blog. I'm glad that you're with me. Uh, I want to say, first of all, I apologize for not doing more of these. I have been traveling over the last three weeks. I was in uh, Montreal for the new CHR launch there. There's a video for that. I was in Spain the following week for the e-golf. Um, and then the last week I flew from Spain home for the weekend and then off to Shanghai for the Shanghai Auto Show. So it's been a lot of traveling, which limits the amount of uh, videos I can do. So back on track now. Lots of emails about the the auditions for the channel, still going through all of those, working with a few people to kind of narrowing down um, the list uh, to maybe more than one person. So uh, stay tuned for that. And I wanted to kick off the show talking about the TDI settlement for Volkswagen owners. Now, a lot of people, I went on the, uh, the, the TDI owners uh, forum or uh, Facebook page on Facebook and reading all of the comments. And a lot of people are going to make out just fine with these TDIs. First of all, Volkswagen is gonna pay you for the value of the car on September of 2015. So that's you know almost two years ago. Now they will adjust the pricing uh, based on mileage, but you're still gonna come out okay on that. And then Volkswagen is going to give money to every single TDI owner, sort of guilt money for the whole situation. And uh, that is, when you combine the two, you're gonna be able to get a lot of the value of the car back. In many instances with the older TDIs dating back to 2009, uh, way more than the vehicle is worth. The only issue for a lot of people is they've wanted to make a change in their vehicle and they've been kind of forced to hold on to their TDI waiting for the settlement to go through. So uh, starting uh, this week, there's going to be a portal open up. So go to Volkswagen Canada, find that, and then you can start the buyback process. So the only issue is if you want to get the trade-in value for your car, and to put the cash towards a new vehicle to offset taxes if you're buying a new car. Uh, Volkswagen and Audi are the two stores that are going to offer that. It's too hard to manage that if you're trading it in a Honda dealer to get that cash uh, discount. The, the Honda dealer is going to give you the book value as of today. So that's one thing to consider. So uh, Audi owners, that's me with the three liter. Um, you know what, that has not even been finalized in the United States and then it has to go through the Canadian system. So the U.S. Um, you know, finalizing the settlement and then coming up with the EPA fixes for the three liter diesel engine. So that's uh, most of the Audi cars, uh, the Volkswagen Touareg and the Porsche Cayenne. I think it's going to be probably closer to the summer or maybe even September before that happens. So the U.S. has to have the final settlement and then the Canadian settlement has to come through and then we have to start the process on that. So anyways, taking a long time, but it kind of leads me into uh, my first question here in the video blog from uh, Gerard McDonald. He says, I purchased an Audi A7 after doing a considerable amount of research. After watching your video on your own personal Audi A7, I ended up buying the gas engine and have no serious regrets. Given everything that has happened with Volkswagen, Audi and Porsche and diesels, would you buy the same car if you could do it all over again? And my answer is, Absolutely yes, I would uh, buy the same car again and I'm really disappointed that diesels are going to be significantly limited in the marketplace. Mercedes-Benz has not had their diesel engine certified uh, for um, two years now. Um, same with BMW. Um, then there's the uh, Fiat Chrysler automobiles diesel situation with the Grand Cherokee and the Ram 1500 trucks. There's a stop sale on those because the EPA is digging through all of the lines of code. And there's literally thousands and thousands of lines of code uh, that they are going through to see if there's any kind of cheating going on. So um, would I buy another Audi A7 TDI again? Yes, I would in a heartbeat. Um, if I had it my way, I would buy a diesel car again. My plan is to get another diesel car, uh, so I'm working on that. The lease on my car now is going to be done in January of 2018, so coming up uh, less than a year now. So hopefully the whole diesel thing will be sorted out. The good news is um, the, the vehicles that are able to be fixed so the 2015 um, Golfs and, and what have you are already being sold, the ones that have been sitting on dealers' lots. So if you like the idea of having a TDI, contact your local Volkswagen dealership. They're going to have some old stock that's sitting there. There's rebates up to almost $10,000 off these brand new cars that are being sitting there. You get the full warranty from the day it's registered. So there's some good deals out there. So if you're interested in having a diesel, you like the fuel economy, you like the torque, and you can buy 
buy a 2015 and 2017 that's got zero or almost zero kilometers on it. So contact your dealer if you're interested. So it's going to be very limited going forward with diesels, which is a bit of a drag. All right, so I got two different emails from two different people. And uh, the, the one is from Grace is in Vancouver and the other one is Derek and he's in Pickering in Ontario. And they both are asking pretty much the exact same thing. Uh, so Derek, basically, I'm going to paraphrase here, um, has a Honda Odyssey minivan, which he likes, but he thinks it's soul-sucking, doesn't like driving it. He recently sold a GTI, so he likes the uh, car, um, but he likes the handling. Um, he needs a vehicle because they have a sailboat, not to tow, but to load everything in the back. So that's why they had a van. So now they're looking at a crossover utility vehicle that's going to be somewhat fun to drive. So in his consideration, he's looking at the Toyota Highlander. That's the sensible choice. And um, then he's also looking at the Honda Pilot. And he's also looking at the Mazda CX-9. But the one he's leaning towards is the Durango. So that's from Derek Tucker in Pickering. The next email comes from Grace. Grace is in Vancouver and she wants an SUV. Uh, they currently drive a Subaru Legacy and they like to keep their car for 10 to 15 years. Uh, they're looking at, once again, the Highlander. Um, they're also looking at the Grand Cherokee. They're looking at the Mazda CX-9. And, uh, and, and it's quite interesting. They're saying, what do you think about uh, the Grand Cherokee? So the Grand Cherokee and the Durango are based on the same platform, same engine, same drivetrains. The Durango is the seven passenger version and the Cherokee is the five passenger version. So what do I think of these products? I really do like the Grand Cherokee and I really do like the Durango. So uh, Derek was asking, he says, what do you think about the GT model? That's the new uh, trim in the Durango line that replaces Limited. And it's uh, not the performance model, but he is considering getting the Hemi engine. He says, I'm not concerned about fuel economy. I don't put a lot of kilometers on the car each year. So um, here's the thing. If you're going to keep a car for, uh, Derek wants to keep his for 8 to 10 years and Grace wants to keep hers for 10 to 15 years. So which one would you put your money on for the long haul for lack of repairs and money coming out of your pocket? Well, for me, I would go right to the Highlander, okay, or the Pilot, but I wouldn't get the 9-speed uh, Pilot, i get the 6-speed Pilot. So those are two vehicles that you know, are going to do everything for you. They're going to deliver, um, you know, reliable transportation over the long haul. And the company that has uh, built their whole brands around reliability and, and longevity. So that's the no nonsense uh, thing and to do. However, I really do like the Grand Cherokee. It's a wonderful product. And the Durango is kind of one of my favorites in the three row SUVs. Now, I don't like to keep cars 10 to 15 years um, because of all of the repairs that you have on any vehicle. There's going to be things that come up. So the sensible choice is go to the Highlander or the Pilot. The Mazda CX-9 is a wonderful product. It is one of my favorite cars that I drove last year. However, it's got a turbo four-cylinder engine under the hood instead of a, a six-cylinder, as is the case with most of these three-row SUVs. So. I just w wonder, it's kind of like their first year with that turbo four-cylinder. What's the reliability going to be like long-term? And Mazda's long-term reliability isn't anywhere near uh, Honda or Toyota. It just isn't. You can look at any Consumer Reports or J.D. Power and & Associates, and they don't fare as well. Subaru is another brand that, I mean, a lot of people love. But if you look at the long-term reliability of Subaru, it doesn't rank as high as some of the others as well. So I know it's boring, but um, if you're going to keep a car, for 10 plus years a Highlander is a pretty good bet and it's got tons of room on the inside and is going to deliver every day this next question comes from uh, Rejoy I like that name in Windsor Ontario I am a new Canadian and a regular viewer of your channel since I came to Canada I'm planning on buying my first car and I have a short list Mazda CX-5 Toyota RAV4 he has about $35,000 to spend and he's also asking will the cash guy be similar kind of vehicle so that's the new Nissan that is smaller than the Rogue actually in uh, um, in the United States they're not calling it cash guy which is the original name for the European market the US likes to homogenize everything so it's going to be called Rogue Sport in Canada they're really going to build a brand around Qashqai uh, and this is a smaller utility 
It's probably uh, similar in size to the new CHR from uh, Toyota. It's bigger than the HRV. It's much bigger than the CX-3. So that's a vehicle I think is going to sell very well because the Rogue is just has monster sales and a slightly smaller version of the Rogue really is what it is I think is going to sell very, very well. Okay, so other things on a shopping list are good ride height, all-wheel drive, blind spot monitoring, uh, radar-based cruise control, forward collision avoidance. He says, I'm avoiding the uh, CRV because of this uh, continuously variable transmission. So there you go. It kind of goes back to the, the previous questions. Now, I don't know how long he's going to keep this vehicle. Uh, the Toyota RAV4, in my opinion, as of today, is the best all-around small utility that you can buy. It does everything very well. It doesn't do anything exceptionally well, but it has lots of space on the inside. It's very well made. It's got a proven four-cylinder engine. It's got a proven six-speed automatic transmission. It's got new advanced safety technology that's standard equipment in the Canadian market. Standard equipment, forward collision warning, pedestrian detection, automatic braking, all of those sorts of things are all standard. That's the Toyota Safety Sense P that is on that um, 2017 model. Then you switch over to the Mazda CX-5 much uh, sportier to drive. I would say the interior is of a higher grade than the RAV4. Uh, it's in-dash connectivity and the sort of um, faux MMI system, kind of like Audi's, is, uh, looks more upscale. It's a very nimble car. Uh, it's a lot of fun to drive. I did a thousand kilometer ride with it through the Rocky Mountains um, from, um, from Colorado into Utah, and it was absolutely perfect. Never set a wheel wrong, and I love driving it. However, it's a little bit smaller, so if you want the ride height and all-wheel drive, you know what, I'm just, is this like a big ad for Toyota? I don't, it just seems to be that the questions uh, seem to be coming up. So try them both and see what you like. Um, if you're much more into the driving aspect, the CX-5 is going to be the one that you're impressed with. So this next question comes from Eric. He's in Calgary. He's got a, a few questions. We'll kind of go through them quickly. Uh, I've been watching you for years. My, um, I want to buy a car for my wife and the headlight she has has poor night vision. With uh, the choice of LED by Xenon and Xenon format, um, provides the brightest illumination. Uh, so by Xenon basically means that you get high-end low beam. The early Xenon headlamps basically were Xenons for daytime running lights and then when you went to the high beams they were halogen. LEDs are more efficient. The reason why they're going to LEDs is why we're putting LED lights on in our home. It reduces the load on the electrical system in the vehicle therefore uh, you don't have to run the alternator and therefore you're not uh, draining um, energy from the engine to create electricity. So that's why uh, the car companies are going to LED. <laughs> the cool one now are laser headlamps. That's right, lasers. They don't shoot the car in front and blow it up. I wish you could in some instances. But uh, Audi now has available in uh, the R8 laser headlamp. So that's the next thing that's coming. So if it was me, I would definitely look for a bi xenon headlamp. If you drive in the country, having that high beam with the xenon is fine. I wouldn't sort of get all hung up on, uh, on LEDs. The next car I'm buying is going to have LED headlamps. I'm fine with the with the, uh, the Xenons. A couple of things you want to look for are adaptive headlamps that turn in the corners. That's very, very helpful. And on some vehicles, it, when you turn the turn signal on, an extra headlamp um, shines into the corner. So they don't just turn. They actually have an extra lamp that comes on. Uh, for example, my Audi has this. You turn, uh, you turn the corner, a light shines in the corner, and that is something I would look for if, I was, if it was available in the vehicle. Next question he has, I have a 14 Forester. Um, you mentioned in a previous video blog uh, about the continuously variable transmission. Should I get rid of it uh, sooner due to poor long-term reliability? Back to the Subaru thing again. Subaru makes wonderful products. They have a, a legion of fans that are sort of rabid about the, the vehicles and they just absolutely love them. And I get it. I'm a big fan of Subaru products as well. Uh, they are not at the same level as some of the other manufacturers when you look at those long-term ratings. However, I think they make a good product. Their continuously variable transmission is an in-house. It's not shared with any other manufacturer. For example, Nissan and Mitsubishi and Chrysler all share uh, continuously variable transmission. Uh, so um, 
they've been out now for quite a few years, probably about five years or so. They've been doing it a while. So you can start to look on uh, forums. What I would do is I'd go to a Subaru forum and read the concerns and trials and tribulations that other Subaru owners have had. Um, my, my advice to you is if you start to have any trouble with the transmission, that's the time to get rid of the car, but enjoy it and drive it. And I think you'll probably have many, many years of service even with a CVT. Um, but getting back to why I, I sort of like I kind of the RAV4 as I mentioned earlier and the Mazda CX-5 I like the good old regular automatic torque converter automatic because it's been around for decades and that's what I'm holding on to. I think they're all going to go to some form of uh, CVT or alternative transmission but until then hold on to those uh, good old automatics as long as you can because they in many instances are bulletproof. This next question is dear to my heart. He says, I'm in the used for a, I'm in the market for a used Porsche 911. Nice. Wanting to buy an 09 911C um, uh, Carrera, I guess he, the, he's thinking of the 997 with the direct injection engine. That's the one to buy. If you're looking at a 997, uh, get the 09 and newer. You get a couple of things. First of all, you get the direct injection engine um, and gives you a boost in horsepower and you get the in-dash technology. Can you believe it? In 2008, Porsche didn't have Bluetooth in their car. 2009 you get Bluetooth and you also get the display audio system which will bring up things like graphics for your music and what have you. Um, he says the prices won't come down. Uh, the naturally aspirated non-turbo engines and the last year of hydraulic steering. Uh, can't go to the US because of the currency situation. Any recommendations on how to source? So if you're looking at a No9 uh, Carrera uh, the problem is the U.S. market is kind of out of reach for us now with uh, buying a dollar at 35 percent. It's just way too expensive to buy. So what I would suggest you do is just be sort of relentless in your search for a 997. It's a wonderful car and I do agree with you that's the one to get. And, and they, uh, you know, before they went to the electric power steering, it's a wonderful, wonderful car. And I think that if you get some of those special models, um, turbo, here's the one that I would buy. If I was in the market for a 997, I would look for uh, a 997 turbo manual transmission. And uh, because the new cars are only available with automatics. Now, if you can find one of those and you can afford it, you're not going to get it for 40 grand, no way. Uh, but that is one I think would uh, hold its value really well in the long run. So just be relentless in your search. And when you see one, make sure, please have it inspected by a Porsche technician that knows what to look for. Please, please, please. Because if you find a cheap Carrera, it's a crap Carrera. Often you get what you pay for. I've got a friend of mine who's looking for a, an air-cooled 911 and um, he is saying, oh, I found this one, it's $35,000. And then I look at it and I go, because it's a piece of crap, you're gonna have to spend $20,000 to get it repaired because Porsches are expensive. Um, and uh, you know, when you, you get what you pay for, so buy the best possible example you can afford. And if it means spending an extra five or $10,000 on a high-end car like that, it is money well spent. But please, 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 get the car inspected by somebody who knows what they're looking at. Final question comes from Greg Smith. Hey Zach, I want a hatchback. Five door manual transmission, all wheel drive, um, up to three years old and prefer turbo. Okay, I emailed back, I said, how much do you want to spend? He said $35,000, buy a Golf R. If you can find a used Golf R, that's the car you should get. Or um, if you want to get a WRX, which is not a hatchback, that would be another great choice. But it's, it's pretty easy. If you want all-wheel drive, manual transmission, five-door, up to 35000 go get a Golf R. And I think these cars are going to hell, hold their value very well in the long run. Hey, if you want to get a question, I forgot to mention how to do it, go to my website, motormouth.ca. In the contact uh, tab, click on that, get a question in, and I will get around to getting the questions answered here um, over the months. So I appreciate that. Thanks to everybody who watched. If you want to leave a comment below, that's fine. But the questions, they need to go to my website, motormouth.ca. Thanks a lot. Speak to you next time.